Thanks for the introduction. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm co-CEO of Applied Brain Research, or ABR, and the other co-CEO is Peter Simmons, sitting right here in front. And I think what we really want to do when we're doing AI is essentially replicate functions that the brain does well. So brains are able to recognize your friend just by the way they walk from far away. Brains can control our bodies, which are extremely complicated nonlinear dynamical systems. And it can do that at very high speeds, playing sports professionally. We can also recognize our own names in crowded, noisy environments. And we can do all of these things, as was just mentioned, for 20 watts. This is an incredible feat. And of course, our devices can do many of these things, and they're getting better. But there is a fundamental difference between how our devices compute and how brains compute. Brains use spikes, and our devices don't. Well, most of our devices don't. Right? There's this kind of chip called a neuromorphic chip, which uses spikes to compute. And what I'm going to be talking about today is how we can get advantages out of using those spikes. So I'm going to start by talking about biological neural computation. What do I mean by a spike? So if you look at the top right corner there, what you're seeing is what happens in a neuron when you inject a constant input. So we're giving a constant input over time, and what the neuron does is it generates these very quick voltage changes or action potentials, which is what we call spikes. What does this mean? This means that as we put a constant input in, we get this very strange nonlinear behavior out. Now, if we look at our normal neurons, right, the neurons that we're used to, artificial neurons, when we put a constant input in, we get a constant input out. In fact, we don't even tend to worry about time. We put a state in, that's our input, and we get some nonlinear function of that state out, which we call an activity or a rate, a number between 0 and 1. So the function that we're computing right now goes from state to rate. The function that the biological neuron is computing goes from state over time to spikes. Those are fundamentally different. And no matter where you look in the brain, you see this kind of activity. So in the bottom left, this is a sheet of neurons. A whole bunch of them are spiking. They're all communicating to together. They're talking with spikes. They're doing information processing. They're generating intelligence. So what? So I told you a little bit about biological computation, but why do we care? We're engineers. So let's put our engineering hats on and take a little bit deeper dive into spiking. So what I'm showing in this movie is non-spiking neurons, break neurons, normal artificial neural network neurons on the bottom. So we have uh, an input neuron, and then what it's sending to the next neuron. And on the top, we have a spiking neuron. And you'll notice that they're getting exactly the same input. Right? They both have this sine wave, which is changing over time. So we're getting dynamic input. So what's happening in the bottom there? In the bottom row, sorry. So every moment in time, let's say we're running this at a millisecond. At every millisecond, we're generating a number between 0 and 1, that's our rate. We're taking that number, we're sending it to the receiving neuron. We're going to multiply it by a connection weight. We'll lose that for all the inputs coming into this neuron. Sum across all of them, and that will drive the next neuron. On the top row, what we're doing is exactly the same input in, but we only have ones and zeros coming in. We either have a spike or no spike. And we don't even have that many spikes, right? So just a couple of ones. Mostly it's white space in there. So that's all you're sending to the receiving neuron. Now you have to do a little bit more work in order to try to sort of replicate your input. But that little bit of more work is actually really cheap. All we're doing is a low-pass filter, first-order filter, very cheap. And you can see that when we do that, it then gives us this kind of smooth estimate of what the original input was, but it's noisy. Now the effect of that noise, of course, is going to be application dependent. But this is the basic difference between these two, right? If we look at those spikes, the only way to tell when a spike happens is by thinking about what happened in time recently. So the top neuron has a memory, the bottom neuron has no memory at all. Time is fundamental at the top, time is imposed on the bottom. So what kinds of advantages does this give us, right? We're, doing, we're taking our engineer perspective. Well, the first one is sparsification over time. We've heard a lot about sparsification, people are talking about weight sparsification, about having fewer neurons be active, but no one's talked about sparsifying information over time. This is a huge benefit. It reduces communication, right? We have fewer communication bottlenecks. It's something that we should really take advantage of. We're also doing less computation. So again, on the, if we look at that bottom row, we've got an input going up and down. That neuron is generating output at every moment in time. It's sending an 8, 16, 32-bit number from itself to the receiving neuron, looking up a weight, doing a multiplication, doing that across all of the inputs, summing them all, and putting it into the next layer. What's going on at the top? 
We've got ones and zeros. If we have zeros, we don't do anything. If we have a one, we do a weight lookup. We don't do a multiply. We just are multiplying by one. So at any millisecond, all we do is four neurons that spike, which you can see isn't going to be that many. We look up the weights, and then we sum the weights, and we're done. But we're almost done. We also have to do that little low-pass filter. That is very local, and we can use exactly the same low-pass filter across every single input into this neuron. So it's extremely cheap. So we have fewer memory lookups. We have cheaper computation. We're doing sums instead of multiplies. All of these things work to save us power. If we can take advantage of these, we should be able to run things with lower power. So what? All right, so now I've given you some theory. I said, all right, in theory, we should be able to get these kinds of advantages. But you might be sitting there thinking, well, how could I even take advantage of this to begin with? Because I want to build big models, right? I want to scale things up. I want to build deep neural networks and so on. How am I going to do that with spiking neurons? We don't know about you know, ways of building networks with these. This brings me to the first product from ABR that I want to talk about. This is called Mengo. It's a neuromorphic development environment. You can build every kind of model you can imagine in here, spiking or non-spiking. We built the world's largest functional brain model, 6.6 .6 billion neurons, 20 billion connections, all using a graphic user interface. It scales extremely well. But fundamentally, Mengo is built to help you build spiking neural networks. You can take your deep neural network, I'll give an example, you can convert it into a spiking neural network and you can realize some of the advantages I've mentioned. Mango is also built to deal with a lot of different kinds of hardware. So when we were designing Mango, we thought to ourselves, you know, AI hardware is probably gonna be a very heterogeneous kind of thing. And we've seen that in the last two days. It is heterogeneous. So what this means for us is that we provide a user interface and API where you can design your models and after you've designed your model, you can then pick what hardware you want to target as long as there's an angle backend. And we have lots of backends. On the left, we've got a bunch of sort of standard backends, run on CPU, GPU, supercomputer, and so on. And on the right, we have a bunch of neuromorphic backends. So you run your model once, and then you can compile it through Nango onto any of this kind of hardware. A new kind of hardware comes on. All we do is write a thin layer of code that's going to take that model and map it onto the new piece of hardware. We've done this many times. So what? OK, so now I've got some theory that says spiking neural networks should be good. I've got a tool that lets me scale up and build the kinds of models I actually want to build for deployment. We're missing a piece, which is the hardware. Right? We can't realize, we've heard this many times, we can't realize the advantages unless the hardware matches the algorithm. And I think it's interesting that you know we've seen this kind of graphic up here maybe four or five times already. The way I see these graphics is that as you go from left to right, things are becoming more and more brain-like. CPUs, serial, high speed. GPUs, far more parallel, intended for graphics, not really neural networks, happen to fit well with neural networks, so you know they dominated. Things like TPUs now designed specifically for artificial neural networks, don't worry about time. And now we have neural market chips, which worry about time, and this is gonna give us significant improvements in scaling. Here's an example of some uh, neural market hardware. So on the left there, that's an FPGA that we have. You can buy it today, you can go and uh, you know, play with it. We think of it as kind of an educational tool that lets people get neuromorphic hardware into their development uh, process. On the right, we have the Intel Loiki research chip. This is very exciting because it's a chip where we can now build interesting demos at a pretty big scale. They recently announced this summer an 8 million neuron uh, system, and they have larger systems coming up in the next few months. Uh, in the middle, we've got the uh, ABR chip. So this one, of course, we're most excited by. Because what we've done here is it's going to be the first commercially available chip, we think. We don't have it until about next year, and then we'll release it shortly after that. But the Wiki, you know, it's a fantastic chip. It's targeted towards research. This chip in the middle, as I'll talk a little bit more about, is targeted towards commercial deployment. So what? So you're now probably noticing the bits of the puzzle are fitting together. We have some theory that says we should get great advantage if we do spiking. We have some tools that let us build big systems, big models to run on and take advantage of that theory. And finally, we have the hardware piece. And if all of these things line up properly, we should get good results. So now what I want to show you are some good results. So what I'm showing here, this is a deep neural network where we've uh, trained it with Mango on the right-hand side and run it on the Luigi neuromorphic chip. And we've also trained it and optimized it for a non-spiking case. So you know, very nice head-to-head -head comparison, exactly the same network, it's doing speech processing. Uh, you can see that the accuracy numbers are similar, slightly better for the spiking network. But we can you know, basically do a neuron-by-neuron -neuron replacement and have uh, this comparison where we see 100 times better 
energy use compared to a GPU, and even five to seven times better compared to edge-specific devices like Mobidius. So here we've seen now a realization of some of those promises that we only saw in theory at the beginning. The other exciting thing is that as we scale this network up, in blue you can see the normal orbit device increases its power use by about 30%, and the Mobidius is increasing its power use by about five times. So again, scalability, something which we just heard is extremely important, is something that matches very well with neural markets. So everybody is sort of familiar with deep neural networks, which is why I started with it as a nice example. This is a, uh, an example of adaptive motor control. It's a little bit more sophisticated, bigger network, and so on. Um, but it's also something which really highlights advantages of neural markets. So what we're doing here is, uh, I'm going to show you in a second, basically doing adaptive control. So all motor control in biology is what's called force control, where you need a model of your arm, so you have to know what the mass is, what the mass distribution is in order to control it properly, properly and move it to particular locations in space. If you pick up an object you've never interacted with before that throws the dynamics off, and it actually takes you a little while to get used to it, and then you can start you know, successfully moving again. So you have to do online learning, or learning at the edge, as people have called it. And here we're showing this working for a uh, robotic arm. So you can see that the arm kind of misses its target, which is a little Santa Claus to start, but then over time, it begins to improve itself. It's learning a better controller on the fly. The chip is doing the learning online. And after a couple of reaches, it actually gets directly to the target. So very quickly, it basically has improved its model of its own, the, the dynamical system that it's trying to deal with, and it successfully can handle that dynamical system. So we thought about the industrial applications for this. And one that we came up with is, you know, typically what you do is you're, you're in your factory, you've got a whole bunch of robots, you deploy them to the factory floor, you tune your controller so they, you know, uh, act to a certain, within certain tolerances, and then you let them go. After a couple of years, wear and tear actually changes the frictional properties of the joints, which means you have to go back and retune the controllers in order to deal with this change. Of course, what we have here is kind of like an automatic tuning system, right? So we uh, use this to uh, basically simulate what happens if you take a robot and have it age over the course of three years and you have very weird nonlinear forces introduced into the system and then turn on this adaptive controller or have it running all the time so it can actually improve performance. So what we're showing here is a comparison between the Luigi neuromorphic chip in purple and then a CPU and GPU running the same algorithm without spikes. You can see that all of the, al the algorithm itself works quite well. The Luigi is slightly better. You'll notice that Mobidius is missing from this graph. Right? That's because you can't do on-chip learning on Mobidius. So the accuracy is about the same, speed is about 25 to 35% faster on the Luigi, and power is about 10 times better on a CPU uh, than on a CPU, and 50 times better than on a GPU. So the nice thing about this example, it's obviously dynamic, high speed, exactly the kind of thing has on-chip learning, right? exactly the kinds of things we think in our market will be good at, and we're winning in accuracy, speed, and power use. So what's next? Hopefully I've convinced you that the theory is something that's been realized, we can measure it in real hardware. Would we, where do we go from here? I've already hinted at this part already. One thing that we're doing is building our own chip. So this chip is based on proven technology. There's a chip, another neuromorphic chip called Spinnaker. Uh, it's been in development over the last 10 years or so. Spinnaker 2 is a brand new version of this chip. These are research chips. What we've done is taken this research chip and redesigned it to be commercially focused and much lower power and be able to run exactly the kinds of algorithms that we know companies are looking for. It's low power because we're using Global Foundry's FPSOI uh, methods, which gives you adaptive body biasing, so you can crush down the leakage current. It also allows for dynamic source voltage and clock speed variation, so within a nanosecond, you can make a measurement of how much demand is being made of one particular core, and you can change the power use of that core. This means that you can do a really nice job of optimizing exactly how much energy goes where, depending on task commands. And lastly, this part might be surprising, it's actually very flexible. So it's a chip which can both run in spiking and non-spiking modes. And you might wonder, well, why the non-spiking mode? Well, if you're trying to do something like detect images to image classifications, is not a dynamic kind of problem. It's not the kind of problem brains are optimized for. But we still know that this is gonna be a kind of workload that people would like to use this platform for, and so we make that available by having rate neurons. We also have spiking neurons, which means that we can now basically have an extra 
uh, knob, if you will, to do optimization. So we can take your particular algorithm, we can find out which parts are going to benefit from spiking, we can tune the chip so the parts that are processing information over time are trying to be very high speed, low latency, have on chip learning, all that kind of stuff we can put on parts of the chip and we can mix and match this within a single chip. And furthermore, we can even put things like pre-processing on the chip. So you can get the entire processing pipeline on a single chip. If we place this in the current uh, neural network hardware landscape, you can see I've got it on the top right corner there, uh, where what we're doing is we're taking unique advantage of neuromorphics to let us realize the kinds of advantages I've been talking about, but it's also commercially uh, quite well established. We have this software stack which has been around for many, many years, and it's, uh, uh, it's also based on proven technology, so there's you know, very low hardware risk, so we know that as soon as we get the chip, as I mentioned about a year from now, it's gonna be commercially deployed very quickly after that. So I've really been talking about the left-hand side. I've been talking about AI tools, I've been talking about the chip and the neuromorphic development environment, but ABR as a company does much more. So we have a lot of customers, we have global auto manufacturers, leading phone makers, and a large energy company, all of whom are customers which have come to us and said, okay, we heard about spiking, is that something that we can leverage? And we work with them to basically take their particular application, demonstrate the utility of spiking, give them you know, specific power measurements for their exact application, and we can show those kinds of advantages. And we also do a lot of advanced R&D. We've developed uh, a kind of network, a recurrent network that beats uh, LSTMs, GRUs, and so on, on recurrent processing and works really well in spikes. We've also done all kinds of things like instead of just doing image classification, do scene understanding, and so on. So in conclusion, uh, if anything I've talked about is of interest to you, if you have the kind of problem where you, know, you think dynamics, low power, uh, and edge AI kinds of solutions are of interest, definitely come talk to me uh, or Peter. We're also doing a Series A uh, $50 million raise right now, and we're in diligence. So if that is also of interest, definitely come talk to us. Um, thank you very much for your time.